This week's Into the Wilderness podcast. Welcome any new listeners we've uh, had in the last few weeks. We know we've had a number of you contact us and some people have been smashing through episode one all the way to episode 100 and whatever this is. I've been quite impressed with people's dedication actually. Yeah, I'm very impressed with it. I'm very impressed. Uh, we've we've had a, a fairly busy few weeks kind of in the office. Lots of editing, lots of projects being finished off. And uh, incidentally, the day that this podcast, it's, it's kind of worked absolutely perfect. I'd like to say it was planned. It wasn't, <laughs> but it, it's, it's worked out this way. So the day that the podcast, this podcast has come out um, is the day that a film that uh, we've been working on, Byron's actually done, done all of the editing on it, um, and there was also a handful of other people that came together to make this yeah. film possible in terms of getting, effort. getting footage uh, from across the globe. Because, if you didn't know, it is the Year of the Salmon. International Year International of the Year of the Salmon. So it's not just in the UK, it's around the entire globe. And we were in London three weeks ago, was it now? About three weeks ago. Must be that, that. And we were um, filming with Sir David Attenborough, and he was doing the, the voiceover and also a piece to camera at the very beginning. And he explains all about the Year of the Salmon. And we are lucky enough to bring it to you on this podcast. Which is also kind of about fish and waterways. Yeah, so it, it couldn't have been better in terms of, one, timing the podcast coming out because we had no decision over when the film was released. Uh, but secondly, the podcast is actually about invasive species and waterways mm. in in the United Kingdom. So you're going to be hearing from uh, Mark uh, Perman charles who heads up uh, the in- Scottish Invasive Species Initiative for the area that we live in. And uh, I first bumped into him a couple of months ago where he gave a presentation to the Esk Rivers and Fisheries Trust, which I um, sit on as a as a trustee and have done since its kind of inception. I don't even know how long ago that was, maybe seven or eight years ago, uh, and giving us an update on the work that he's doing. And that is what he is going to tell all of you good people about during this podcast. Yes, very enjoyable. Uh, we, we do talk quite a bit specifically about the northeast of Scotland, but as we discussed throughout the initiative is based in the northeast of Scotland, but these problems are not unique to Scotland. They are across the UK and across the entire globe you know, when it comes to uh, invasive species and the threat that they hold to native wildlife, waterways, uh, whatever it is, hills. Uh, and what's happening in the northeast of Scotland, I guess, is a trial that could be rolled out across the whole of the yeah. UK. Um, based if, on volunteer work. Yes, indeed. Now... The Year of the Salmon, back to that. I think the best thing for us to do is let Sir David Attenborough explain what the Year of the Salmon is about and what um, what threats the salmon are under. So we'll, we'll, we'll let his voice do the, the speaking here. The salmon is the king of fish. Their journeys up rivers are some of the most thrilling spectacles in the natural world. And yet, now, their very survival is at risk. They hatch in rivers and small streams and after a period in fresh water descend to the sea and migrate thousands of miles across the ocean to their feeding grounds. Here they feast and grow to maturity before returning after one or more years battling upstream to the stretch of the rivers where they hatched. Here they spawn and produce the next generation. But now, the survival of these astonishing fish is at risk. Dams blocking their rivers, over-exploitation, pollution of the water, the spread of parasites, diseases, and fish escaping from open cage salmon farms. All these, together with the inevitable effects of climate change, are threatening their very survival. The International Year of the Salmon will help us kick-start efforts to reduce man-made impacts, restore their habitats, and so ensure we don't lose the king of fish forever. 
So, I mean, we really wish that our whole podcast was just... Narrated by David Attenborough. Narrated. It was just him. We, we really do. Um, and we wish we had more time to spend with him uh, to, to do a podcast with him or something like that. But Maybe. You never know. He, he is, He's a very busy he man. He is very, very, very busy. Very busy. And uh, we were fortunate enough in between writing scripts and filming outside and looking for locations in London... Uh, that you know, we had a fairly good chat with him about different things he's been up to, about his past, and a little bit about the upcoming uh, yeah. series that's out on Netflix. So yeah, we got some some sneak peek stuff that will probably will never be on the Netflix. No, well, who knows? I don't know. Maybe, uh, but we got some sneak peek stuff on the new Netflix show, which is called Our Planet. It looks incredible. Yeah, up, uh, the first trailer dropped last week, didn't it? Yesterday, yeah. yesterday. Well, I say yesterday, so the day before this podcast yeah. com- com- comes out, which is the the April, the I don't know, so we're in March, aren't we? March. Yeah, we're not in April yet. Please. Uh, yeah, no, March, March the twenty fourth, twenty first of twenty nineteen. Yeah. Uh, but if you go on YouTube, just type in Our Planet, you'll find you'll find it. And, and equally, fr- if you want to see the um, International Year of the Salmon film. Go on our YouTube, Pace Brothers. Pace Brothers it's YouTube. the latest video on there. It's also doing the rounds on Facebook right now. It was a, it's been uploaded this morning uh, by Salmon Trout Conservation, who kind of spearheaded this project. Uh, Andrew Graham Stewart was the the gent who commissioned us to do it. Who was the very same man, same organisation, who was behind the Loch Marie film that we made three years ago. So they're, you know, in terms of output, what they have produced in terms of films and who has seen them and who's been involved it's absolutely astronomical when you think in the grand scheme of things they're not very big organization no 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 and and you think of some big organizations that have nowhere near the same output as that and i'm talking organizations in general just any organization No, they're doing great work and like daryl said at the very start we it wasn't just us we had to pull in a lot of help from people all over the place a lot of folks some of whom we know in this country, some of whom we didn't before this project, and uh, some people from over in North America as well, to get the footage together uh, so that we could make this film. Some of it was our, our own, but the vast majority is not. Um, but we, we pulled the whole film together around um, the interview that we did with Sir David. So if you want to hear him speaking to a film that you've just heard, then you need to go and find it. So like Barry said, Facebook, YouTube, uh, just type in the year of the salmon on YouTube, and I I'm gonna say that it's probably gonna be the first one that comes up soon. I think so, yeah. <laughs> uh, but if not, just find our page. We'll be on Instagram and all over the all over the the show, and we share have, it. Sorry, I was gonna say and share definitely it. Definitely share share the love. We have a winner from the competition which we ran two weeks ago, which was to win a Hornady uh, reloading with Rosie mug yes. and the Sea Said doormat. Two was prizes. Is that what it was last it was week? Two. Okay. I was just racking my brain to yeah. say it was two. And all we asked you was, what rimfire make do you use? Yeah. So we said, uh, I mean, basically the only rimfires that are in any of our cupboards in the family are CZs, and it's always been like that since I was a kid. Uh, but what did you use? So we had a lot of people emailing in, a lot of people commenting on, on Facebook and the various social media platforms. And uh, I didn't pick one over the other. I can't actually remember what the, the winner used. So it was just a random selection, but I'm very pleased to see the spectrum of guns that people are using. And the winner for this week is Nicholas Riddle. So congrats, congrats, Nicholas. Contact the show and we will get that sent down to you. We, we saw that the previous doormat has got a good home oh, already. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we did. Uh, we went to a farmer, didn't it? Yes, it did. Yeah. 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 Wipe yeah. those muddy boots. <laughs> we have another competition for this week's podcast, which is to win the latest edition of the Hornady Reloading Manual. It is the reloading manual that I use myself. In fact, I've only ever used Hornady reloading manuals, and I'm this. I think this is like the third version that I've owned, and it's the latest one. So pretty much all the new cartridges are in there, apart from the ones that were maybe released at SHOT Show at the start of 2019, because this edition came out in 2018. And we're going to make it very simple. Uh, feel free to email into the show, as always or comment on the various social media when you see this come up as a post. Uh, But we want to hear what your suggestion for guests is. So give us a suggestion of a guest. And And if you have the email address, that would be good as well. That would be good, especially (laughs) if it's uh, somebody who's maybe a little bit more high high profile. And then we will try and pick one of the most exciting suggestions for a guest as the winner. That's a good idea. That is a very, very good idea. Um, I need to mention that we are still running 
our auction to raise money for the pangolins to uh, primarily buy camera traps for part of their research projects over in Africa, where I will be heading in only a matter of weeks now. Uh, I'm going to give you an idea of the stuff that is still running right now over on Facebook, or you can visit the website, thepacebrothers.com, click Pangolin Auction, and all the information is there on that page as well if you don't use social media. The you stuff can, you can, I was going to say, there's also a donate button, which actually a couple of people have used, uh, so you can donate directly to the Pangolin cause. Well, it, it's to us, but it's going to the buying the camera traps. Uh, and that's mainly for people that just don't want to you know, buy, buy, buy anything from the auction. So the, the stuff still running right now is there's a 20-bore Beretta cleaning kit for a shotgun. Um, there is... I oh know that one's done. There's still the opportunity to have an amazing portrait of your dog. Um, by uh, All the information of the people who donated these, I'm not going to go through it because it would take too long, is on the actual post. So, like I say, on the website or on Facebook, you can read who's very kindly donated these. Uh, there is the opportunity to win a handmade... A leather sheath and a mora knife that fits in it. Uh, a morning's clay shooting and breakfast with Rachel Carey. Um, some rugby tickets for Scotland versus France. Yeah, oh, which, which will be sold out after Scotland's performance yeah, against England. Will. I guarantee it, you will not be able to get your hands on these tickets. They're worth over £100. Yeah, so they, they actually came from um, Daryl and Una. Uh, there is a chance to bid for the same Hornady reloading manual that I just mentioned. You might have a chance to, to win as a prize in this week's podcast. Uh, it's a, a showful gilet, um, but it's like the, the one with the loading pockets on on the front of it. Um, some Diditto boots, the same welly boots that we wear ourselves. And there, lastly, this is the last thing that's up right now, but I'm going to tell you what we're going to be posting in the next week. The last thing that's up currently is a day's rabbiting on Invermark Estate for four guns. Uh, Did which we is, find out what that was over ferrets? Or? No, I haven't, uh, I haven't had any ba- information back on that. I will, okay. I'm going to update it exactly what kind of rabbiting it is. It doesn't matter what it is. Invermark's, it's going to be a great, Invermark's beautiful. It's so. going to be a great day. <laughs> Uh, so the thing's still coming up. It's amazing. Like literally every day, somebody Get emails in, more, kindly donating yeah. something else to the the auction. I still have one more signed uh, Donny Vincent DVD, so that'll be going up. Uh, we have a Hearn uh, Merino hoodie that's literally just come in today. That's going to be going up. Uh, a bronze um, a sculpture from Jenna Gearing of a, a rodeo, which is incredible she contacted us last week um claire brownlow is doing a painting of a pangolin which i haven't seen yet we've she talked f- we talked about her art before on we the have, show. yeah um her husband charlie brownlow was uh on the show probably last year and yeah. we talked a little bit about her art so it's always absolutely stunning so i'm excited to see that and we'll be getting that up um scott country have donated a, a torch for us to put up um, Paul Wilkie, who is uh, local to where we live and has been a podcast listener since day one, has very kindly donated a knife that he won and has never used before, so that'll be going up. And last, uh, lastly, there's... Um, uh, I haven't actually read the details of this. It's like a, a sheath knife combo from yes. Blade Armor. Um, but the full details of all of that stuff will be going up. None of that is currently... You can't bid on any of that currently, but in every day from... Now for the next two weeks, you'll be seeing more stuff coming up. So yeah. ultimately, don't miss out. Don't miss out because some of these will close tomorrow yeah. um, because they've been up for two weeks already. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, it, as soon as this podcast goes out, you listen to it, you get online, get on com, find the auction lot, and uh, it explains every way that you can place a bid because they're all on Facebook, but you don't actually need Facebook to bid. It's all yeah. It's all explained online. Yeah, on the website. Yes, uh, and if you want to contact the show, uh, because we've already mentioned a few times to contact us, it is podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. Now, is that everything? Should, should, I think, should we get into I think the show? Everything. Okay, well, enjoy the show all about invasive species. Mark, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. Thanks for coming down the road and seeing us today. Now, you've just spent the last... 30 minutes or so with our dad because you've just signed him up as a volunteer i have what on earth have you got him doing well i uh i i took took advantage of the situation and and his and his good nature 
and he's he's now signed up as an official official mink monitor for the for the for the project. So um, he's he's adopted a mink raft, which we've which we've got out in in the burn running past the house. And firstly, we'll be looking for mink tracks, and if we if we get any mink tracks, we'll be putting out a trap and uh, seeing if we can catch a mink. He's got a lot of chickens and pigeons and that sort of stuff. So there's there's obviously the the concern there that they they might be uh they might be circling the pens so to <laughs> speak. So if if they are around, this will be this will be an area they'll be visiting. So hopefully we can pick them up in the burn if they are there. Because when you came and you kind of gave us an update on the project, which we we're going to talk mm. about at the Fisheries Trust meeting. Well, we actually just had one last week, but there was the one before that where you yes, sat and, and talked was. to everybody. Yeah, yeah. I th- and you were talking about the project and uh, revitalizing the mink trapping program. I thought this is a perfect job for my dad now he's retired. <laughs> <laughs> so I do. It's ideal. I, I have a lot of retired men. And women, to be fair, but mainly retired men who uh, who, who like to go stand out on rivers and, yeah. uh, and and shout at things. So it's uh, it's brilliant because you know they're they're really enthusiastic. We get people who you know who care about Scottish biodiversity, UK biodiversity, and and they want to make a difference. And this is something that's incredibly low impact. I mean, it's when you're in tracking mode. So when you've got the clay pad out in the in the raft, it's it's once a week you need to check it, you know. And then once you're trapping, it's it's once every 24 hours, but it's such a low tech system it's it's not a huge amount of time and it's incredibly effective and and that's that's brilliant because that's what we're looking for we're looking for things small things individuals can do and that adds up because what you get is you get one person here one person there and suddenly you've got 50 60 people in Angus all monitoring for me these are all volunteers all volunteers you know so give us an overview of the project so people can get a a feel of what it is that you're trying to achieve and and how it how it's come about how's it how's it funded who's been the sort of spearhead of making this happen so the project is has two 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 funding providers it's uh the majority of the funding comes from a heritage lottery fund they put in a bid for the for the for the money and they've got i think over just over a million pounds from that end and then scottish natural heritage have put about 500,000 in as well and then through volunteer time and that sort of stuff we're looking to get an equivalent value of in- in-kind contribution of about another million pounds Amazing. worth of, of volunteer time now the reason we can do that is because the project area ranges from my area so I cover Angus and Perthshire that's the bottom end of the project and the project goes all the way up the east coast all the way to the Black Isle so we're talking a, a huge project area with um, hundreds of hundreds of volunteers involved and that time really adds up and and that work really adds up so it's it's uh it's it's a really ambitious project we're really pleased we've we've got it's a four-year project we've got four years worth of funding and we're hoping that we can we can do some really exciting things during that time and early early signs would show that we've uh we're doing okay. That's incredible. So that your first, this is year one. This is well, we this is year two. We're just starting year two. So this all kicked off this time last year. I, okay. I, I came into post actually this week last year, um, and as is often the case with with projects of this scale, it takes a year sort of to ramp up for the project officers such as myself to get to know the lay of the land. I mean, <laughs> I was, um, my previous job, I was working for a, for a parks charity down in finest Milton Keynes. So it was a, <laughs> it was a bit of an adjustment going from the pinnacle of, of uh, environmental beauty that is Milton Keynes to, to, to Persia and Angus. It, you know, I had to lower my standards drastically <laughs> compared to, to what's going on down there. But, um, you know, it, it takes a while to, to get the lay of the land especially with with the invasive plants where are they what's going on who are the landowners etc cetera, etc cetera. so we we did a, a decent amount of of work last year just trying to get the ball rolling and this year we've we've got that momentum and we're picking up more volunteers we're working with landowners we're working with estates we're working with environmental organizations we're working with volunteer groups and the momentum's really generating so year one was sort of let's 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 get this thing going and then the next three it was years the found, was, foundation exactly year. and and the next three years we're, we're hoping to really make a, a, a significant amount of progress because i think obviously i'm i'm contracted for for the next next three years i don't know what's going to happen after that but what we'd like to see is we will have put in four years worth of building a network of people based locally on the ground, training them up, giving them equipment, giving them skills. It would be a shame for that then just to disappear after four years. Yeah. So we're hoping that maybe we can we can we can go to another funding provider and say, look, we've 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 put all this investment and time into we've creating achieved. this ne- network. Let's keep it going. Or hey, can we extend it? Because you know the northeast is a great start. It's the most ambitious project of this kind. But we've um, 
it's just the northeast there's the rest of the uk and the mink are, you know the mink don't care that we're trapping here giant hogweed japanese knotweed doesn't care that we're controlling <laughs> no, here it doesn't care. it's all over the place so it's it's great that we're doing it in this area we'd like to see that continued after the lifespan of the project ideally we'd like to see it done more so um yeah it's, it's very exciting it's incredible that you're putting uh, one million pound value on volunteers a lot of yeah. times we don't think about what the Put real the value cost mm. would be if you had to replace volunteer services well. With paid services, that's a well, million pounds. I can I can give you a very very easy comparison. So right now we we I have a limited contractor budget for invasive plant control, and um, I'm I'm I've put out my tenders and I'm getting bids back. Now on average I can expect a, a, a contractor per day one man one man day to cost roughly about two hundred and fifty pounds a day. That's one person out spraying giant hogweed. Now the way the project looked at it is we've said okay. We could throw a whole amount of money at contractors and they could come into an area maybe they're not familiar with and they could spray, do a good job, of course, that's great. But we'll burn through our funding, we'll burn through a million pounds really, really quickly. You know, How about what we do is we find local people who want to give their time to combating invasive species and we train them up. So just today, actually, I've got a course going on in Brecon. We've got eight guys, local people, some fishermen local estate worker, just some people in the local community, and we're putting through them through their spraying qualifications, that costs about four hundred, five hundred pounds each. Mm-hmm. But then if you think about that contract they only need to work for two days. They only need to work for two days and you've already made your money back. Yeah. And the guys <laughs> I trained up last year, they've done pff, 15, 20, 30 days with me. Yeah. Yeah. So the so value, value we're getting, yeah. you reach that million pounds very quickly. Well that's our that's our ambition. But we you know when you start looking at the numbers and you go, well, we could invest in contracts or we could invest in people and get the equivalent value 10 times, 15 times over. So it's it's a no-brainer for us because it, it's a much better use of money. And even better, you've got local people who are invested, who care about their local area. I was going to say, that's, that's, that's a, a, a major component yeah, yeah. is you actually get local buy-in to what you're trying sure. to achieve. For sure. And that's really important because contractors... Are, are great and they they have they have a purpose and we're deploying them in areas that are particularly difficult we think mm, that's not quite appropriate for volunteers but what you can't get from a contractor is someone who's based locally knows their area well and really wants to see their area not be taken over by an invasive species and it's potentially on the ground and is uh, every well, day exactly. potentially if they're walking yeah, dogs and exactly like you know so what we're seeing is the quality of the work that's being done when the volunteers come work with me. So, for example, we'll say, right, we're going to do uh, giant hogweed treatment. I need three or four volunteers to come out with me. We're going to do backpack spraying on the South Esk on Finhaven Castle Waterbeat. Brilliant. We'll go out, we'll do it. And the quality of work, because the people are invested, because it's their local river, is equivalent to contractors and we find that you know people will go that extra mile because they really want to they want to make sure it's done right because they care they don't want to see giant hogweed or japanese knotweed or whatever on their river and that's that's incredible so not only do you get value for money that's not what it's all about it's also about giving people skills it's giving people the opportunity to get involved in protecting scottish biodiversity and once people are empowered like that you can really see people you get some people that are, are, get really quite obsessed about it and they you know they think well, you know how can i do more and they get really into it so it's it's incredible to see so it's it's really rewarding from our end because yes in the past big contracts have had, uh, big big projects such as this have had huge contractor budgets the invasive plants are still here this yeah. isn't this isn't a one or two year problem this is a 10 maybe five year problem if you're lucky so you're looking at a minimum half a decade or a decade we need to make this sustainable and having people on the ground trained up who are local and are volunteering and we're supplying the equipment and the and and and, and the training and that sort of stuff that's much more sustainable mm, in the long term yeah. there's loads of hogweed on my river loads yeah. of it we, yeah we talked about it actually in the yeah. meeting that mark, mark was was there for mm. um just below the the bridge at mary Kirk. yeah um, all, all the way, all yeah. the way down. A lot um, of that, apparently, a lot of that comes off the railway bridge. Really, the, tri- the trains drag <laughs> it along there, and it comes over the railway bridge and drops yep. down. That's why below there is where most of the hogweed does yes. downstream. Hundreds and hundreds of plants there. That's so. This is probably a good time to talk about vectors. So, 
<laughs> I didn't think I'd hear that word. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I know. It's like being back in GCSE yeah, math, yeah. isn't it? So vectors, what vector essentially is, 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 a, is a method of transportation. How, how have the invasive species gotten, gotten here? And um, globalization is, is a brilliant thing. We get products from all around the world. We travel all around the world. It's fantastic. It's so much more convenient with the technology that we have. Unfortunately, that means plants can travel around a lot easier too because they get they come on materials they come on vehicles people moving around train lines are a really big vector in the uk because often what you'll get is you'll get giant hogweed and japanese knotweed and himalayan balsam on the verges of a train get caught on the train blown further along whatever and you'll find suddenly it's Just spreading like a, a along the train of lines. Hell. Yeah. yeah exactly and then it goes across a water body like the north esk and then it flows along the river which is another vector. So the two main vectors we're, we're seeing is, is humans. And then if it gets into a water course, that's why this project is focused on water courses, because giant hogweed, Japanese knotweed, Himalayan balsam follow water courses because that's an easy way to spread. And then obviously the mink, they like water courses as well. So that's why we've chosen them as our four target species, because we know how they spread. It's along rivers. Obviously, the human element is, is an F element we can't control. But if we can deal with the river side of things... And we can educate people. So, you know, for example, we had a farmer up on Early Estate or near, near Early near, Estate. Near where I live. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, you know, great guy. Serious Himalayan balsam issue. Didn't wasn't treating it, and you know, every year it's getting worse. And he said, "I said, well, you know what? You know, are you driving sort of farm machinery through it and all that sort of thing?" He said, "Oh yeah, you know, I'm I'm driving farm machinery through it and flailing it and that sort of stuff." And I said, "Well, what time of year are you doing that?" And he said, "Well, sort of." late July, August, I said, well, all you're doing is spreading seeds for it because it's, you know, it's seeding at that point. So you're just chucking the seeds across the, your landscape. You're helping. Yeah, you're helping. <laughs> helping so, the weed. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So it's, it's simple stuff like that, like educating people and saying, well, you know, if you're, if you're going to flail it, good time to do it is in June when it's not seeding, but when it's big enough to flail. Yeah. But then you're taking away that potential seed source. That's a great time to do it. Bad time to do it is when it's seeded because all you're doing is doing the plant's job for it and in fact better than the plant could so rivers we can deal with human behavior we can deal with it's all about education it's all about making people aware and that's that's really key but stuff you can't control is it coming along on a train and then ending up on a on a river because of that but that's 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 a slightly more complex issue yeah it is because obviously you've got a whole <laughs> it involves the whole rail system that involves network rail <laughs> yeah. which is uh which is a uh, is, uh, but is they a can't point. even run their own trains so. well it's, it's mean, a, <laughs> you, you're dealing with a company that can't actually run a train <laughs> beth got and, stuck and, and it's their job <laughs> then then you can't expect them to deal with anything well, other than that well, daryl said it for you mark you didn't need to i <laughs> i will i will He's remain neutral i don't need i don't need to remain exactly i have no no qualms <laughs> with calling out Network Rail, Scott Rail, and whoever else go. operates on our railway systems. There you go. Why is it a big deal? I mean, you know, plants, 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 yeah. and mink. You know, okay, we've got other furry animals that kind of look like them. But <laughs> yeah. explain why it's such a big deal and why it's a problem for us. Sure. So, story time. Let's let's start with let's start yeah, with a bit of a history yeah, lesson. I know. I think, yes. Upon us. Pull up a chair. Um, let's do. Let's do mink first, yeah. and then we'll do plants afterwards. They're probably the most exciting. Yeah, mink are, mink are a bit more sexy. Um, let's move around a little bit, at least. Um, so mink, American mink. We, we have European mink, not in the UK. Um, but American mink were brought over in pff, sort of early 20th century for, for fur farming. It was obviously part of the fashion industry, hugely profitable. And um, what we saw is... Pretty much since since day one, you bring over a species, you put it in a cage, some of them get out. Now, there's a common misconception. There are hugely publicised uh, events in the 90s, all these uh, no, the releases, animal, all the releases. Yeah, for the animal rights. And, and it's a misconception that that was the point where the situation started getting bad. Actually, mink had been escaping regularly since the 30s or 40s, but just not in such a high-profile way. So actually, populations were already pretty much established by that point. Now, how did we get there? Well, what happened is obviously these minks started escaping and the department in charge of the environmental sector at the time, uh, Ministry, oh God, here we go, Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Farming, or MAF, which is an unfortunate sounding acronym, 
I suppose DEFRA sounds like cleaning cleaning material. (laughs) So I don't know. (laughs) We need to work on our acronyms in in that sector. But anyway, so math um, in sort of the the late 50s, 60s, looked at the issue and and, and, um, it's in their name, agriculture, farming and fisheries. So they looked at the mink escaping. And you have to remember, this is a time before the concept of biodiversity, ecosystems, anything like this, it wasn't really anything we were cognizant it was, of. It, our main concern during that period was let's produce food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we didn't understand that actually producing food fits into a healthy ecosystem and good biodiversity is required to keep the whole system going. But anyway, at that time, it was agriculture, farming and fisheries. Does it Do mink affect these three things? And so MAF looked at it and they went, well, no, not really. So the decision was made then and there, it's not it's we're not it's not an issue we're gonna we're gonna we're not gonna control them we're not gonna try and hunt them down that sort of thing and that was the key point with invasive non-native species the earliest time you can start dealing with the problem is the best time because every year you leave it the situation gets more more worse more worse gets worse there we go and um this is key the situation gets more expensive to deal with as well. Yeah. And that's the it main... Compounds year it compounds year. Every, every breeding year, season. Every year. Yeah. Every breeding season with a plant, every season it is able to seed, it gets worse. So what you end up with the situation is, uh, it's a, you know, 60s, 60s and 70s, they go, oh, well, it's, it's not really causing much problems and it'd be a bit expensive anyway, so we'll leave it. And we leave it and we leave it and we leave it. And then all of a sudden, we've got this huge problem. Now, that's not to say they didn't try. In the late 60s, I believe, MAF decided, well, actually, we're going we're gonna to do a token effort. So they employed... But, but just press pause on you for a second. Yeah. Before we, so what, what issues were the mink causing, though? Because, right, well, this yeah, was okay, the thing. they're everywhere, but who this cares? This was the thing. At the time, we didn't realise they were causing anything because no one was looking. Yeah. No one was looking. So no one, as far as we were concerned, they were, there was no, no harm to agriculture, no harm to fisheries. Now, what the mink were kind, quietly doing, how, how can I put this in an analogy? It was, it was the mink equivalent of a all-inclusive package holiday where you never left the all-you-could-eat buffet, <laughs> f- but for mink. Yeah. It was banter. It was lads on tour. These mink essentially were in an environment where all the native species had developed without that kind of predator. <laughs> Yeah. And they had no predators. And they had no predators. Yeah. And yeah, the mink themselves had no predators. So the mink have gone, this is brilliant. We've, we've, the fur farm was a bit weird, but we escaped <laughs> that. That was fine. And now we're in this place where the native species that we predate on have no idea how to protect themselves. So we're talking your water voles, your ground nesting birds, other small mammals, lizards, even reptiles. They'll, they'll eat their way through whatever they can find, basically. All these species had absolutely no protection because they'd never they'd never had to deal with a predator yeah, like this. It's completely alien. Yeah. They hadn't evolved. It was you know it was completely alien. So literally, the mink were just sort of grazing their way through native biodiversity, and there's no the only two constraints was carrying capacity of the environment they were in, and natural causes. There was no direct predation by anything of any kind. There's nothing. There's nothing there to stop the population from booming up to the point where it's... Apart from us. Well, apart from us. Yeah. And there was a bit of shooting going on. People were trapping and shooting them, specifically in Scotland. Because they were uh, an alien they, species. They so were recognised was... recognised as an alien species. Yeah. Um, but it was all happening individually. So you had individual states doing bits and bobs or a farmer here and there, and there was no strategy. And what we saw is by the sort of late 60s, early 70s, math started to realize it was it was becoming a bit of a problem they thought maybe we should do something and they brought in seven guys seven guys for the whole of the uk it's ambitious that's uh, very ambitious and by this point mink they'd been escaping since the 30s they'd made it england and wales pretty much across the board and they were already in the lowlands of scotland by that point so um 70 uh, seven guys running around with 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 nets hitting hitting mink on the head at that point isn't going to make any difference so they wound that up really quickly and what we saw for the next several decades was mink spreading across the uk establishing in in areas of brilliant habitat even in areas of not so great habitat because there was nothing there to stop them there was a little bit of trapping and shooting going on but in no way was that having a negative impact on the populations the population continued to boom and we've now ended up in a situation where a key indicator species like water vole declined by 95%. And is a lot of that tied to, to mink? Almost. I mean, you've got other factors. Of There's course, habitat. you've got habitat loss, yeah. climate change, etc. But you, if you look at the, 
the, the sort of graphs of populations of the mink increasing, you can pretty much plot it to stuff like waterfall opposite. decreasing. Yeah. You, you know, it, or exactly around the same time. And we know these are the sort of animals they, they, they predate on. So you're seeing this, oh, just one species, just mink, having a massively disproportionate impact on the biodiversity of the UK. And we're sort of going, you know, we're going, well, I haven't seen any, you know, water hens lately. Well, all these populations of water voles are yeah. disappearing. I wonder, I wonder what it could be. And there's this huge hairy beast rampaging through the countryside. And we're going, ah, it can't possibly be that because we've already decided that they're the only threat. They cause no threat to agriculture, fisheries or farming. So they're not a problem at all. We didn't put two and two together that these things disappearing and well, these, these alien species running around. The proliferation of them. Yeah, we're causing the problem. Yeah. So um, obviously there came a point. In I think in the 2000s, there's been a lot of work done by um, Aberdeen University, who we're partnered with in the project. So the, the project is delivered on the ground by the fisheries boards. Uh, I work with the Tay and, and the Esk fisheries boards. And Aberdeen University sort of gives us our, 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 our inter- information and intel and, and keeps us looking intelligent. So it's like your science yes, arm. Yes, they're the science arm of the project. And um, they'd been doing a lot of work on water voles for a long time. And, and going, well, you know, where, where, what's happening? Where are they going? You know, the, the habitat's going, but it's not going that significantly. There's still viable habitat out there. Why, why are water voles no longer in the areas that are, are viable habitat? And so they started developing a theory. Okay, it's, it's probably the mink because we know the mink are there. We know when the mink escaped. We know when the mink, uh, when the mink populations, the uh, waterfowl population started declining. And they started putting two and two together. Um, I, I think other discoveries were being made across the UK to, to make these connections. Um, and what happened is finally in 2010, 2011, the Scottish Mink Initiative came into being, which is sort of a predecessor of, of And that's of our the first project. time I heard about it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this was the first attempt to control mink on a landscape scale. Because what you had is you had people doing it on an individual scale, individual estates, farmer here, you know, no coordination no real no real way of actually putting pressure on a large scale onto a mink population and 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 the way the mink initiative looked at it is they said right you know we need to we need to coordinate everyone we need to find new people as well we need to get as many people on board as possible get our mink raft coverage out so the mink raft was 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 thought up by the is it the Gaming and Wildlife Conservation Trust, or whatever. Uh, oh, shooting. the Game, the Game and Wildlife Conservation yeah, Trust. Yeah, that's the one. GWCT. Yes, that's those are the ones. Um, they came up with the actual mink raft design. They they pioneered that area. So, the the mink initiative project used these rafts, and it was incredibly successful across the project area. It was a similar similar project area, um, but mainly Aberdeenshire, mm-hmm. Angus, a little bit of Perth, not so much further north either, and. Um, Huge success. You know. Explain how, how they work. Yes. Because there's, you, you've got a, a period of checking to see what's coming yeah. over these traps. So Minecraft is very simple. It's essentially two pieces of balsa wood with a layer of foam in the middle so it floats on a water course. And what on top, you've got a slot cut into the middle of the raft and within that you put a clay pad, a tracking pad, and then you stick a tunnel over the top. Now Mink, for reasons we've said, got no predators here so they're incre- incredibly confident and they're incredibly curious and those two those two elements luckily work against them so they see a tunnel they have to go investigate so what you'll do is you could be you, food in there could be food you never know <laughs> there could be a water vole that's just uh, not expecting anything so um these they'll 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 go investigate the tunnel you'll pick up the tracks once you've got confirmation that minker in an area you deploy a trap into that tunnel and the mink are incredibly likely to go through it again because it's always worth checking if there's food in the tunnel. Now, we don't even tend to bait them because they're so curious. They will come through you know the tunnel. Gonna pass through, you know yeah. they're going to pass through. They follow the watercourses. They follow the rivers. They follow the burns. So if you have traps and rafts along those points, they will travel past them and most probably through them. So what we find, actually, is the Scottish Mink Initiative having a huge amount of success using this system. And, you know, if you have four or five people along a couple of kilometres monitoring a couple of these rafts, you've got really good coverage and you're, you're, you're almost guaranteed at one point or another to pick up mink if they are in the area. So they were seeing huge catches. They were, you know, they were pulling them in. You know, some rafts were catching sort of 20, 25 mink a year. 
Wow. Huge numbers. I was looking through the historical, well, sort of the, the well, historical, it's only 2011 to 2015, not long ago, but they were they were pulling out huge numbers in certain areas, or at least moderate numbers in all areas. You know, it was, there were huge numbers of mink out there. Um, incredibly successful. Again, a four-year project, the funding went away for three years. That's probably why the what, that raft that was down that's there. A, that's what it was from the yeah. original project. It was project. from the original yeah. project yeah. because it, it, it was put out twice, but the, the second time it the, never got picked the up The huge again. flood came well, yeah. and, and it, it got kind of flipped, flipped upside down, upside down yeah, yeah, and no one ever yeah. came for it. And this is the thing. So the, the project was incredibly successful, um, but unfortunately the lifespan of the project ended. There was no follow-on funding things sort of died off a bit I, 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 before my time I assume what they were hoping is, is our sort of project would maybe come into place and it would, it would carry it, over yeah. um, unfortunately there was a three year gap but luckily what we've seen is we've we've sort of re-established the mink network since since 2018 since last year and um, catch numbers are way down from what we saw before so, so in the, the year that it was it left off when the record stopped, yeah, you haven't seen this massive spike. No, in a few we years haven't. We ha- what we were worried about was there was excellent trapping for three four years, populations were, of mink were pushed down, and there was this three year gap. What we were worried about was there was this be- you know, population would recover started, massively, yeah. but what we've seen is yeah, it's it's recovered a bit, but not nearly as much as we were expecting. So the mink populations in the project area across the northeast are quite significantly down. So this is a very effective system, and the mink populations are not, uh, they're not reacting well. They're not bouncing back, because yeah. it turns out, if you actually put your mind to it and do a coordinated effort of controlling, controlling this kind of species, you can keep the numbers down. Now, can we eradicate in the northeast? No, that's not an option, because this is only going on in the northeast. Yeah, so mink travel huge differences yeah. distances so they'll come from somewhere else now there's there's limited there's i know Cairngorms national park is doing some great work in this area they're they're on the ball with mink um we i, I think over in loch Lomond national park as well they know they've got water voles there so they're really hot on their mink as well so there's other there's other organizations groups projects doing this on smaller scales we're, we're the largest project to do this across in, in terms of surface area but um it's all about linking up so we won't be able to. We could keep the populations down, but we won't be able to eradicate until this is going on across everywhere, you know, the whole of the UK, really, because mink will travel huge distances. I mean, look, the previous projects, the Scottish Mink Initiative, did um, genetic analysis on a lot of the mink we caught, and um, to get an idea of where the populations were and that sort of thing. And mink were caught down in the Dundee area that had genetic markers from the spay, so that will show you how far wow. they can travel. So. If you're trapping and getting all the rid of the mink in Dundee, you think, perfect, solved the problem. Well, some mink on their holly bobs will come down <laughs> from the spay and you turn your back and suddenly, boom, suddenly there. there's mink back there again. So this is the problem we're facing. Yes, lo- locally it's working, but because there are areas where we're not trapping in Scotland. Yeah, you'll always get in- you're, you're always You're always going to have that infill and that's, that's, that's the biggest problem. But if we can show proof of concept, which the previous project did and we're trying to reaffirm, if we can do landscape scale, coordinated, volunteer-led for the most part, monitoring, trapping and control, mm. we can reduce these populations. And then there's that sort of end in sight of saying, well, could we even end up in a situation where we could get rid of them from, from the UK? Because if you had a, a big enough, dedicated enough network of volunteers yeah. and the equipment's in place, yeah. so once the project, because you know, the equipment can be maintained or, or replaced over periods of time, yeah, yeah. there's no reason why a concerted effort over 10, 20 years couldn't get yeah. the population to a point where you know, it, it is almost... Yeah. Um, irreversible for them yeah. to come back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I would like to think, especially because they are uh, not confined to waterways, but they they're dedicated yeah. waterway mammals. Yeah, exactly. You 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 know where they're going to be to a certain degree, so that's that's really encouraging. But you know that 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 end goal is theoretically in sight. We could we could achieve a situation where that would would happen. Mm. Obviously, right now the northeast is is a, is a good start. Yeah. If we can, if we can prove that it works, who knows? It might get picked up by more people. But well, what, what's what's quite cool about that the the whole network thing and kind of proof of concept over a couple of years mm. is that if something happens 
another plant species that is incredibly aggressive. Yeah. Probably more likely to be a plant species than an animal. Yeah. I would say because we'd be on top of it probably faster. Yeah. Uh, you've got a network of people that can jump onto it way well, exactly. faster. Exactly. So, yeah, this segues nicely into plants yeah. then. So, on the plant side, we're looking at giant hogweed, Japanese knotweed, and Himalayan balsam. And Japanese knotweed, I guess, is particularly more concerning for homeowners. Yes, yeah, homeowners. It's obviously had a lot of press around that. It, it can damage foundations. And invalid sort of your. Insurance. It does. It, yeah, insurance companies get get absolutely freaked out by it and that sort of thing. So it's it's got real sort of financial implications implications for for everyday people. Um, giant hogweed is obviously a concern because it it's has nasty stuff. It's, it's it, the, 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 the sap is is what is toxic. You know, mm. it burns you. Um, so that's got a human health element to it. And then overarchingly, these all have quite disastrous impact on on the local environment. And um, where do they come from? Well, as with a lot of issues, the Victorians have have a lot to answer for. They what were their fancy gardens? Yeah, you know, jolly old chaps wandering across the world collecting plants to bring back home and put in their garden. <laughs> And um, it's all very great at the time. And, you know, again, that's predating a time where the concept of an invasive non-native yeah. plant no was one even cared, a thing. No one cared. Thinking about it, yeah. Exactly. It, wasn't it even was on, pretty. It was so. pretty. <laughs> so we'll stick it in our garden and show yeah. off to our neighbours. That's that's literally... The I want a garden that looks like Jurassic Park. <laughs> I know. That's really <laughs> well, what I mean, is. giant hogweed basically it is. It is. Ju- Jurassic Park plant. You look at it and you go, that's not, that's not from this planet. That's no. not supposed to be here. It's from the Caucasus. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, these things... And, what you have to remember is we, we have a huge number of non-native species in the UK. It's very it's very difficult to, to have a situation where you've got non, no, no non-native species in the country. And, and the UK has loads. I mean, you look at a lot of the species of daffodil that you'll have seen this yeah. spring. Yeah. They'll be from other countries. And the definition of a, a, a non-native species is, is is argued about a lot. Some people say, well, it's the Ice Age, and some yeah, people yeah. say, oh, it's when but the we, Romans came. We've kind of naturalised yeah, a lot of species A lot of stuff now. has naturalised. There's a lot of deer species, exactly. which we, we, we accept are native exactly. species, but they're not really. Exactly, exactly. But how so, far do you turn the clock well, back? Well, exactly. Yeah. That, it, it gets very subjective, and you go, well, pff, okay, well, fine. If we're doing Ice Age, then we're an invasive species <laughs> to a certain degree. So <laughs> let's, you know. Um, but no, what, what you end up with a situation is you, you, hundreds, thousands of, Thousands of plants out there are non-native, but they're not invasive, or they don't they don't exhibit invasive tendencies right now. Okay. And what happens is you'll get a plant that goes from a non-native, naturalized almost uh, situation to suddenly becoming invasive, like a daffodil, just sits there yeah, peacefully, bides its time, kind of doesn't waiting, really do much, and then takes over the, <laughs> takes over the world and suddenly yellow everywhere. <laughs> yeah. um, but no, and th- and this is this is the case with giant hogweed and Japanese knotweed and Himalayan balsam. For, to a certain point it was just in people's gardens on the estates in the ornamental gardens that sort of stuff not causing any problems whatsoever and then there came a point where suddenly it it got out you know the seeds got out to, to a water course or something like that and it starts slowly taking over the landscape again that was the moment where we should have acted we didn't and now we end up in a situation like on the South Esk which is wall-to-wall giant hogweed like on the north esk again lots of giant hogweed or the burvy which is pretty much ba- double banked japanese knotweed all the way up it and that was that was a situation where it escaped from one source probably yeah. back in the day it just traveled and all it's the just way been down. doing going all the way down the catchment for the last 20 30 40 could could even be early 20th century you know these things sometimes it happens quickly sometimes it happens slowly we're now in a situation where you go to certain sections of the rivers and you go, oh my God, that's all that's here. And that's really concerning because going back to the concept of biodiversity, what we don't want, we don't want a monoculture. We do not want a monoculture. And we especially don't want a monoculture of something that's not supposed to be here in the first place. Yeah. I mean, because like, they're so big. Well, they just cover everything. Well, this is the they thing. They just choke everything else and out. They, 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 they force out all native biodiversity, all native plants, all the all the insects and wildlife that relies on those native plants is then forced out because there's they, there's nothing for them to to, to eat there or whatever yeah. you know because who knows what to do with giant hogweed again the native Does, species is there anything really not really here. no no neither Japanese it doesn't look weed. very tasty no well, you would yeah exactly <laughs> but no giant hogweed Japanese knotweed Himalayan balsam there's nothing that really you know what my, is my it? my bees take the the pollen from yeah, the Himalayan exactly. Um, balsam but exactly that, and that's and that's, that's the only thing that's the one benefit that people say to me i say okay you know that's great 
But what what if one year when the Himalayan balsam is taken over everything, there's one year it doesn't flower? Yeah. Well, there's a problem. There's yeah. nothing else to. There's nothing else there. Up. Then what happens to the bees? And everyone goes, oh, yeah, okay. And that's the danger. It's we don't want a monoculture. We especially don't want a monoculture of a, of a species that's going to take over everything else. And if something goes wrong, all those native well, it's, species. It's the very that, definition. That might, well, there's no di- diversity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's there's nothing. That you, you've got you've got a twig instead of sort of a, a pyramid. You know, you've got one thing. So there's and there's knock on effects. You know, stuff like Japanese knotweed, giant hogweed. When they die off, there's nothing else growing there in the winter. So when it floods, yes, it yeah. imp- increases the the yeah, erosion. It, it, it's and flood it just events, it's completely. That sort of thing. You go down the esk yeah. where where there had been the, yeah. the hogweed, it is just a flat yeah. dead yeah. area. Yeah, it's just it's just flat, and if you get a spate during the winter, it will gouge out that area. You'll get more erosion. It will erode into farmland, which really annoys the farmers. That sort of stuff. You know, you you're losing land. It's changing the morphology of the rivers, and it's exacerbating flood events because there's no native plant matter to help soak up some of that flooding as well. So it's it's a perpetuating issue. It goes around in a circle. So there's a number of issues. There's the, the impact on biodiversity. There's the impact on human health or property and that sort of thing. And then there's the impact on uh, the actual morphology of the river and that sort of thing as well and these you know you start to add it all up and you go you know this is this is a problem this is a really this is a real problem on a number of levels yeah and um and it's just a, so it's the, just a plant it's just a plant yeah. the, these three species the only way to get rid of them is spraying so yes let's talk about control excellent um so you've got let's do a giant hogweed so when it's small you could dig it yeah in areas where it's easy to access if you dig it up get through the tap root you can you can do it quite quite easily. The roots are quite shallow. Are they? Uh, no, the roots aren't particularly shallow for giant hogweed. But with a good with a good spade, yeah, and could, a bit of elbow you, grease, with a bit of elbow grease, you can make it happen. In my previous job, we we used to dig hog, hogweed because we only had a small amount of it. Better than putting chemicals out into the environment. It was manageable, especially right next to our water. Course. Yeah, exactly. You get get ten fifteen guys out. Pff, you know, you get through it in a day or two. Fine. It's all about getting it before it seeds. So you can dig it if you're not able to dig it don't have the manpower the terrain's too difficult whatever spraying is the next thing now we use glyphosate which is the only chemical in the uk for approved use in or around water is that roundup that's roundup pro vantage yeah Yeah. active ingredient glyphosate now that may change obviously glyphosate's been in the press a lot lately Um, roundup are in the shit right now (laughs) monsanto are in trouble right now um (laughs) And the I know the EU is looking at it closely. The UK is also looking at it closely. DEFRA is looking at it closely. Because it kind of just kills every well, everyone and the people using it. It's potentially a carcinogen. Yeah. Which so there's only think, been one case. Though. There's only been one confirmed mm. case in court where they've had to pay compensation. Three hundred million. Or yeah, it's a fair bit. Yeah. Fair play to him. But in that case, unfortunately, it's not bringing back because I think it's terminal. It is terminal. Uh, the prob the problem was there. He was his employers equipped him with no PPE whatsoever. Yeah. And gave him no training as to how to actually use this. It's a pesticide. It's dangerous, you know. Um, he was using a lot of it, and he was he? using incredible. Yeah, he amount was, he of was it. a landscape for yeah, he, for yeah. As far way. as I know, for example, with our volunteers, we put them through a city and guilds qualification. They get their spraying qualifications that they have to pass. There is a test. Then they are they are trained up just as much as I am to go out and do this. That's the same course I went on. It's a two day course with a two hour test. And then we equipment with all the PPE they need, all the equipment they need, and then I'm there to help with anything else they need as well. So we really, as opposed to this employer, are saying, yes, this is this is a dangerous chemical. Monsanto denies that it causes potentially these, these, these health problems, but we're not going to take the risk. We're going to use the maximum PPE available. We're going to be super safe. We're going to make sure everyone who's out there spraying is qualified, and that way we reduce it virtually to zero that there could be any issues obviously that didn't happen in that case and this poor guy has had his his life destroyed and you know that puts it in 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 sort of stark relief you say well you know we need to take this seriously yes it's the only thing we can use on the rivers is that because it's safe in water it's it's for yeah it's, well it it's approved for use in and around water doesn't mean it's safe okay and that's a key differentiation now i'm not intelligent enough to be able to make a judgment on why they've done that wording? It's approved for use. Yeah, you wouldn't want to pour gallons of it in you the would river. Not but want for to. spraying along a riverbank. Yeah, it's a, it's for spraying pool. along a riverbank, it is. It has been deemed by DEFRA and the EU as 
suitable I, I guess and appropriate. some smart person's worked out how much water dilutes yes. it. Yes, yeah, they'll know yeah, how many exactly. yeah, micrograms so, of yeah. it per... Well, exactly. Now, you want to avoid getting into the water as much as possible. Yeah, ov- obviously. But <laughs> yeah. with something like giant hogweed, once it's quite big, it's the only thing that you can really hit it with. And because it because it's on the water edge, that's the only thing you can use. Now, if you miss your window to spray it, and now it's you know it's ten foot tall, it's huge. You've got the big seed heads. Now, yeah. the seed heads are the main concern because those seed heads they can have tens of thousands of individual seeds in each seed head. So think of all the potential new giant hogweeds that is. <laughs> yeah. So what we do that late in the year is I go out with volunteers with extendable saws, and before the seeds actually fully develop, when it's just flowering, them off. we lop them off, and that takes away that plant's viability. So that plant has now wasted its time because it's put all this energy into creating those lovely seed heads. We lop them off before they're able to germinate. Brilliant. We've stopped another year of seeds. Now, the problem is with giant hogweed, if it's been established in an area, those seeds, if any seeds it's produced in the past can remain viable for up to seven or eight years. Is that how long the seed bank yeah, survives? Yeah, it's a long time. So if you oh. start, so stuff we started treating last year will probably still be around to a certain degree at the end of the four years if the seed bank's been quite established. And that's the problem. This is why it's a long-term issue. And of course, issue. you could have had seeds that have washed down the river well, exactly. five, six years before. Exactly. And- so that's the other thing. So what we do is a top-down approach. So I've worked with the landowners from the top down. So we start, we do a sweep, basically, and it's a mixture of volunteers and contractors down the South Esk, down the North Esk, down the Burvey, over on the Tay. That's a little bit more complicated, though, over there. Slightly different situation. But you've got to... They'll, seeds will travel downstream, we dig them when we can, we spray the hogweed when we can, or at the very least we try and get in there and lop the seed heads off before. You can't get everything, but if you start to whittle down its ability to reproduce, the numbers and the density will fall quite quite drastically. So what we're hoping is over the four years we'll see a significant decline in the density of giant hogweed on these rivers. If we can then show that we're reducing the density, we can show that there's this is working. But you've got to be coordinated. You've got to do top down because there's no point in the guys at Montrose Basin doing hours and hours, days, days worth yeah. of spraying, and hundreds of thousands of seeds are just flying down the South Esk into Montrose Basin yeah. because the landowners further up aren't doing anything. So it's a it's a unified effort. Talking of landowners, mm. for invasive species such as those that you've been I'm um, talking about. Yeah. It is the landowner's responsibility to tackle them, right or wrong? Yeah. So, legislation, very difficult. The sort of fundamental legislation around invasive species is the Wildlife and Countryside Act of 1981, I believe. And within that, it lays out that it's an offence to allow an, uh, non native invasive animals or plants to be released into the environment. And to spread, you can be you can be prosecuted and fined if you are caught allowing these species to escape from your land. Now, there's no offence to have them on your land, and that's the key issue. But there's an offence if you let them escape. So the, a seed is effectively escaping. Yeah, it's, it's, it's breaking free. <laughs> yeah. But the problem is proving that that oh, seed yeah, no, be so came hard. from that land. Yeah, yeah. And that's why up to this date, I think last year was the first prosecution we've actually seen of invasive non-native species being be, being able to be traced back to, to one person. Now, I won't name names, but I'm pretty sure I can identify where the species on the rivers around here have escaped from originally. But it's so far down the road now, I've got very strong suspicions, but in 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 a, in, a, in a legal sense, it's it's yeah it's almost impossible. Bar, yeah. yeah, exactly. The so done. the legislation is really really weak. There's there's very little in place to to give you you know if you can't make that direct link, you haven't got a leg leg to stand stand on, and. The most common argument is, oh, well, it's always been here or oh, it came from somewhere mm. else. But you must, I mean, to to make it work, yeah. you must be working with all the landowners yeah. pretty much along the whole systems. And I, yeah, I would yeah. guess there's been uh, no issue with cooperation. No, you know, people I mean, are very willing to help you help them. Yeah, well, exactly. I'm I'm here offering. I'm, I'm here offering to help them, essentially, because it's a problem. It's not going to go away. And I have the offer of I can train up people. I can equip you, I can give you the chemical, I can give you my time to help you. The only thing I can't do is go do it all myself for you. 
So it's a collaborative thing where I come and I talk to an estate or a farmer or or, or just you know just a guy who happens to own a bit of bit of river on his land, and I say, look, you know, this is a problem. I have a way of helping you, and nine times out of ten, they see it for what it is, which is an opportunity to get some free training, free equipment, free materials to deal with a problem that maybe they didn't have the money to deal with, or they didn't know how to deal with. Because, for example, the amount of people I've caught strimming Japanese knotweed, well, it spreads vegetatively. So if you're strimming Japanese knotweed, you're just spreading it. <laughs> Listen carefully, everybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll get onto Japanese knotweed in a minute, but that's that's the thing. So you've got you, you've even got people who are trying to do the right thing, but they're doing it wrong. wrong yeah. And that's just an education. Yeah, thing. and that's just an education thing. So I say, whoa, 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 drop drop the strimmer right now. Let the, me tr- the strimmer let, does seem yeah. like the to- the tool of choice. It is, the way and it always it. is. It always is, no matter what it is. It's it's the tool of choice, and and you say, nope. Let me train you up. Let me give you the equipment. Let me work with you. Let's do this together and we can solve the problem. And that's if you, by approaching landowners with that offer and saying, look, I can help you. I've also got volunteers who just want to come out and help as well so we can increase the manpower on your section, that sort of thing. Let's work together. Let's get this done. And I think people, when people start seeing everyone around them doing it, doing it you kind of feel, you'd feel yeah. a bit guilty if you well, were exactly. sitting on your hands. But also people suddenly feel, oh, it's not just me, you know, because often what you'll get is, well, I'll do it, but no one else is going to do it, so why should I bother? Yeah. And if you can start to get everyone working together, they don't have to talk to each other. I'm there to coordinate it at the end of the day. They can carry on doing what they're doing. But if we can coordinate all those efforts together and people start to see a positive improvement and the cost is taken out from, for them, apart from their time, we're taking away the cost of training, the cost of material, all that sort of stuff. People are usually very keen to get involved, and it's been a it's been a very positive uptake so far with local landowners, and it's it's been it's been really good to see. Specifically in Angus, we've we've been really successful over the last year in getting buy-in. We, we've been talking obviously about the northeast because that's where mm. where we are, but there ha- surely they have exactly the same problems, if not arguably worse in some places down south with yeah. Japanese knotweed uh, because their climate is yeah. a bit better than ours. Uh, is there things like that going on down south? No. Kind of no, no big community no, this, base. This is, this is the first of its kind in the UK. And we're a, re- we're a proof of concept. Similar with the mink, we're the second phase of a proof of concept with the mink side of things, with the plant side of things. This is, this is pretty much the first time this has been tried on this scale in any meaningful way. And um, what we're hoping to show people is that this isn't a short-term problem. This is, like I said earlier, this is a five, ten-year problem. And you can't just deploy contractors for two years and make the problem go away. We all have to pitch in together. We all have to do this together. It has to be done in a in a systematic way as well. We have to do top-down control on these rivers. And by showing that to people, you get the buy-in on the local level. And hopefully what we can then show to funding providers and other people that might be trying to do something about the invasive species in their area in, in England or elsewhere in Scotland, they'll see actually this landscape scale where we, we, we work with the local people is the way to go because it's very difficult otherwise to get that the sort of coordination you need to make a meaningful impact. You'll get a huge amount of money thrown into a certain section of a river, say a landowner suddenly decides, right, I'm getting rid of all the hogweed on my yeah. land. Well, if he's got hogweed either side of him, it's going to come back, you know. So pointless operation. Exactly. So it's 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 showing that no, you know, this isn't a problem we can we can we can deal with individually. We have to work together on this, and if we do, there's a real end of end of the tunnel sort of situation where we can get this under control. But but from in terms of a proof of concept, yeah, it's actually quite an important thing because it let's just say this does work, yeah, and from an outside looking in view there is no reason why it will not have a significant impact in the long term yeah. over 10 years with multiple people working and yeah, yeah. for bang for your buck it's the most efficient oh, yeah other countries around the world would would be looking at this kind of thing for sure for sure and you so know, it is quite it's, it's actually really important it's the next very, few years. it's very important what we're doing and you know invasive people it's only in the last sort of decade, decade and a half that people have started to realise what invasive, what what impact, what negative impacts invasive species really have on our biodiversity. So we're we're all still sort of groping around in the dark. Now that we know there's a problem, how do we solve the problem? And when it comes to mink and these invasive plants, we're hoping that we can show 
a potentially successful way of dealing yeah. with it. And it's a landscape scale, volunteer led almost project, but with resources coming from a funding provider and, and dedicated staff like myself based within these areas, based locally to work with people locally, make it personal, make it relevant to their area. And suddenly you'll get buy in and you'll get action and hopefully you'll see improvement. What's the overall project actually called? Uh, so it's the Scottish Invasive Species Initiative, okay. CC, which is unfortunate because you stick that the other way around and <laughs> pe- people have been Googling it lately and it's been causing problems. But um, we didn't, we, 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 can't, we can't take into account geopolitical events, so we, we roll with what we roll with. Um, but yeah, no, Scottish Invasive Species Initiative, we've got a website. And, uh, you know, we've got all, we've got a load of information on there as well because we get a, lo- a large amount of people from outside the project area saying, this is brilliant, can we get involved? Yeah. Unfortunately, we can't help you. And that's really frustrating But you us, can give but them information. But we can give them information. Yeah. And like I said, even small stuff like don't stream Japanese knotweed, that goes a huge way for some people because they go, oh, well, now I know how to deal with it. I can deal with it. And that's really important. It's sometimes hard for people to really get a grasp of the long-term impacts of something like this. So in the in the States, um, they one of their largest ecosystems is the sagebrush habitat, mm. uh, which is currently the most threatened ecosystem they have. And one of the main reasons for that in the lower um, the lower elevations, not uh, not the only reason, but one of the main reasons, is because of an invasive invasive species of grass called cheat grass. Right. And essentially, that grass does a very similar thing to the species that we've just been talking about. It gets in there, grows up, and smothers Crowds everything. out everything else. And soon, all the sagebrush and the three hundred and fifty plus other species of plant and yeah. wildlife is no longer there. Yeah, you just see that biodiversity yeah. just collapse. Yeah. Well, and and they're seeing it now. Mm. I mean, they're sort of they're towards the end of the road. Yeah. They they are on the brink of it not being recoverable. They yeah. realize that what they've got left, they cannot lose anymore yeah. and they have to start recovering those areas. Yeah. And sometimes it takes that to happen for people yeah. to really appreciate. So yeah. th- it's great that this is happening <laughs> now what seems like a long time before any irreversible damage yeah. can be done. I would say we're at a tipping point right now. And we, we need to we need to make a judgment call on what we think is important. Do do what do we value in yeah. in, so in, in the terms of Scottish biodiversity? Because if, if we want to keep the environments and the species and the biodiversity that we've grown up with and, and enjoyed and, and our parents have grown up with, we need to act very, very soon right now in fact if we if we if we don't want that if we think that's not important that's absolutely fine we can let things continue how they are but the wildlife and the landscape and the the biodiversity that our children will grow up with in that case will be very very different from the one we see now and that's how we decide what do we value do we want do we want to to keep what we know and love and that that intricate web of biodiversity or do we want to go with a lot less interesting, a lot shallower, a lot worse biodiversity situation, and then look back and go, well, we never knew we had it so good, yeah. you know? And that that's yeah. we're, we're at that tipping point now. Ideally, we'd have been dealing with this 10, 15 years ago. It is what it is. We know what we know now. But now, same with a lot of things, climate change, habitat loss, all these things, we now understand the issues. We can't plead ignorance anymore. For a long time, we didn't understand the issues. Yeah, no, we, we now know. So we have to act now. We have to make the right decisions to, prevert, to preserve UK biodiversity, but specifically Scottish biodiversity in this context, because Scottish biodiversity, there's a reason I came to Scotland, is because I grew up coming to Scotland. Scotland is part of my identity. The wildlife that I saw here, the, the, the environment I got to be in, the things I got to see, the species I got to encounter... They mean a huge amount to me, and I think they mean a huge amount to people in Scotland in general. Yeah. It's big for our tourism as well, all these sorts of things. So to lose what makes Scotland, the, well, as far as I'm concerned, the most beautiful place in the world and the, one of the most interesting places in the world from a natural standpoint would be a real shame. And to look back in 20, 30 years and go, well, we could have done something about and we that, didn't. and we didn't. That's unforgivable as far as I'm concerned, and you know. And there's lots of lots of instances like that, and it, yeah. it's another great example 
of why this this notion of complete hands off I was going to say management but it's not management yeah. but a hands off approach yeah to management is quite possibly misguided mm. and fanciful in many instances yeah. because can you imagine if we walked away from our river systems tomorrow so never went it, back what, on what will be will be and what will be will be I, th- I don't think we would like the outcome I don't think we would. And what we have to remember in the UK is that our environment isn't natural anymore. We have tampered with it for thousands and thousands of years. We can't walk away now. Since the Iron Age. Yeah, we've yeah. we've spent a very long time buggering it up. <laughs> what 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 is going on out there is not natural anymore. There is nothing natural more or less going on out there anymore. To walk away now would be a de- dereliction of duty. Now that we have the understanding, now that we understand and we can make positive changes, be that, you know, reintroduction of species that have been killed or, or eradicated, Re- reconditioning and reintroducing ecosystems that currently don't exist or we've lost wetlands, that sort of thing. We can do all that. We can get back to a more natural state. But right now, nothing is natural. We're in a situation where nothing is natural. Everything is out of whack. And to take a hands-off approach at this point would be a little bit hypocritical, seeing as we've spent the previous however long Thousands of years, messing yeah. it all up and then going, oh, well, no, we'll leave it now. We'll let it do its own yeah. thing now. Well, it's too late now. We bear responsibility for the yeah. situation we're in. Uh, and particularly now that we have species yeah. that were not here well, 100 exactly. years ago. Because th- there is no way an American mink would have made it here by itself. It doesn't know unless how, unless there was a raft. Unless there was a particularly enterprising <laughs> sort of new world discovery mink in a boat. Yeah. For the same example, Japanese knotweed would have never made it to the UK without us. We've caused these problems. We can't now sit back and say, Well, let's see what happens. We have to act now because we know what's gonna happen, because we've got evidence for this, for the situation like it was going on in the US. You know, we, we've got the evidence now. We understand what impact invasive species can do. And then when you tie that in with habitat loss and with climate change and all these other factors, it's a key element. And you go, well, actually, you add it all together. And what we see out the window now, even though it's unnatural, what we might see in 30, 40 years, we borderline alien, let alone unnatural, because, you know, th- things, things will get worse from here. I think that the the best case situation for us going forward in terms of land management is a situation of sympathetic management mm. to the habitat. Yeah, and and I I can't ever see a future not in our small island where we don't play a role in shaping and balancing the wildlife and the environment yeah. because, like you said, we've come too far for us not to continue to play that role. And, and that's it, not and to say that we can't make it better than it is now, yeah. but we will always be involved. Oh, yeah. And no there's, there's too many external factors. Yeah. Now, uh, just going from sea, there is people that can come to our around our coast and go fishing in certain areas that we have no control of out at sea. And then you've got people coming in. And, you know, in terms of... Uh, biosecurity checks the uk probably has the most relaxed it's in the world it's terrible it's awful <laughs> when you compare it to new zealand or, or australia, australia yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's yeah. Abs- it's absolutely awful and we've chosen to do that yeah you know and that's what's crazy we've we've chosen to say okay we don't really value uk biodiversity we don't we don't value native species and that i find that shocking because it's point of entry you know we we live in a globalized world now you know stuff is coming in Every day, ships are coming in, and most of it's accidental, but it's arriving. Yeah. You know, the fact that we're not we're not biosecurity is not an issue that we're particularly cognizant of, or even looking at other countries and going, oh, "I wonder why they do that," and then turning around and going, "Oh, well, that's a lot of nice hogweed," you know, and not putting <laughs> two and two together. You know, it's 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 a bit ridiculous, and I, I I struggle with that one. There's a lot we can learn from looking at the mistakes of other countries around the world, yeah. and there's a lot that they other, other countries around the world can learn from. Our exactly, mistakes. and I think I think with this project, we we've taken the first step to maybe giving an example and saying, look, we can turn this around. It takes all of us, or it takes a lot of us working together on a local scale. Let's do this, you know, because the situation isn't going to turn around by itself. 
And there's a lot that needs to happen. Government needs to take these things more seriously. I mean, government right now, as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I can tell, Westminster doesn't really even acknowledge climate change is real at the moment. So, you know, we've got a lot of issues where we need to really get the, the political class more engaged as well and say, look, guys, you obviously have a lot on your plate. We understand. But a healthy environment... <laughs> Brexit. Well, exactly. <laughs> there's a lot going on right now. I can't, I can't imagine what it is. But anyway, there's a, you've got a lot going on. But underlyingly, we all have the right to a healthy environment. And a healthy environment is key to our survival. I I always took issue with what Greenpeace said, which was save the planet. That's not true. The planet's going to be fine. If yeah. we mess everything up... It'll still be the here. The planet's going to be fine. It's had nuclear winters. It's had volcanic sort of periods where everything was lava. I think it can work around us. What we need to understand is if we, if we mess up the environment to a point... Save ourselves. ...where we can't live <laughs> yeah. on it, we're the ones who then struggle with that is the, the planet itself life will find new ways we won't and that's the problem and if we don't acknowledge that and we and we sort of keep the environment as something separate then that's not going to work because that's where our food comes from that's where our water comes from that's where we live that's the air we breathe and if we don't acknowledge that we're going to be in serious trouble and that's what going back to what you said earlier that that's why it really matters that we decide what is of concern to us yeah. and what do we care about? Because as you very astutely point out, and I was actually having this discussion with somebody the other day, it was over a long enough time horizon, none of this really matters because the planet will still be here. It may be in a yeah. very, very different form to what it is now. We might not recognize any of the species on it and the planet's not going to give a shit no. because we might not be here. Well, exactly. But for our time horizon that we're concerned with, we need to think about what matters to us. Well, exactly, exactly. It's you know, it's it, we've we've got to we've got to understand that, and I don't think as a species we do right now, and that's that's key. You know, it's yes, planet will be fine. Don't worry about the planet. Worry about us, and inadvertently we'll then have to start worrying about the planet because a healthy planet, a healthy environment, is yeah. key to our survival, and. That's that's just a fundamental fact that I think people sometimes can't quite get their yeah. heads around, and you know it's it's fair enough. You know I, I've got I've got a got a, a younger family member who you know I was I was I was with the other day, and you know where do apples come from? Tesco's, and you go, oh god, we're all gonna die. So <laughs> it's you know, game over, basically. You know it's it's game over at that point. You know so we, we've what's happened is technology's been brilliant, and it's allowed us to to make these huge leaps and we've learned so much as a, as a, as a species in, in just the last couple of decades. I mean, you look back 20 years ago, some of the stuff that was going on to now, we know so much more. The knowledge growth has been yeah, it's phenomenal. Been in, in, phenomenal. But we've somehow dis disconnected as a society from the environment to a certain degree. and thought, well, we don't need that because we've got technology. Technology will solve. Well, actually, fundamentally, Everything relies on the environment, so you you can you can do all you want to try and disconnect from that, but it's always going to come back to where do you live, because if we don't have these fundamental things which a healthy environment provides, it doesn't matter how much we know and how much technology advances, we rely on those basic elements, and that's never going to change because we're after all mammals at the end of the day, yeah, and we need yeah. those things, and we are part of the landscape. Yeah, exactly. You know, and we've done very well for ourselves as a species. We've Some done incredibly say too well. well, too well, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps we've we we flew too close to the sun, but you know, we what we can't forget is how we got here, and and that's what's happening to a certain degree. Obviously, that's invasive species is just a small element within that bigger sort of picture of things, but is is a key element to say you know we what do we value? Just like we were talking about. What uh, what were you doing before you came and worked on this project, Mark? <laughs> So I, I know it had something to do yeah, yeah. with uh, crayfish. Oh God! Was that directly before this? That was directly before this. Yeah. So um, before this, I was uh, I was working in a park in Milton Keynes. Believe it or not, it's exciting, exciting, exciting stuff. Um, yeah. Well, I, just just to go go into a little bit 
of my background. I, start from the beginning. Yeah, start, start from the beginning. Origin story. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm, as you might detect from my accent, I'm not. I'm not Scottish. I'm, I'm from London. Get back originally. over the wall. I know. I snuck in. I'm an illegal immigrant <laughs> sneaking into <laughs> this country. Species. Yeah, I am. I am. I'm expecting to be trapped and dispatched immediately. <laughs> uh, no, well, I, I grew up in London, and growing up in London, you know, you don't really get to see much environment like but suburban london yeah yeah for sort of center of london and uh, concrete jungle and all that sort of fun stuff crystal palace is is at least slightly leafy we've got some nice parks but i always remember going away when i was young to scotland and places like that and going you know this is this is fantastic i want i want to when i grow up i want to do something outside and, and that sort of thing so i had the opportunity very lucky to be able to to do some degrees i did in my undergraduate environmental conservation in uh, Bangor University in North Wales. But, I, mean, I don't know where Andrew went. Yeah, it is, yeah. but that is one of the hubs of environmental science in the it UK. Is. Yeah. It is. Our it friend is. went and studied uh, environmental uh, science. Environmental right? science. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is the go-to destination for rain enthusiasts. It's, um, <laughs> rain it's, uh, enthusiasts. It's, it's also good for environmental stuff too. So um, I, I did my, my undergraduate degree there in environmental conservation and uh, and then went and did a, a, a master's degree in environmental law at Lancaster University. And um, one thing led to another. I was going to go become a, a high-powered environmental a lawyer. lawyer. And I thought, yes, this can be brilliant. I'm make, make loads of money. But it would be, be no brilliant. Fun. And then I, I, I sat down and thought about it and went, wait a minute. When I look back, why I even worked this hard to do all this in the first place, it was those memories of being outside as a child and working with nature I don't want to sit in an office and that sort of thing so I I, I abandoned that and uh, and uh, I, ever since then I've been been bouncing around various things it all started at a, at a call center for the RSPB in the middle of London and I rose like a phoenix from that <laughs> from that experience to uh, was this a, this a call center for members membership, membership yeah membership yeah yeah uh, well may, maybe not a phoenix something less <laughs> less spectacular and much more grumpy and aggravated but um anyway so that you know I I started from scratch again and and and, and I've been lucky to have some breaks and and end up in some interesting places Milton Keynes included it's a, it's a wonderful part of the world but yeah so Done some done some various things. Ended up in Milton Keynes, and that was um, the first time for a while. I'd, I'd done a bit of invasive species stuff, but that was the first time I sort of came into into contact with it a bit more again. And that was giant hogweed and crayfish. Now crayfish, obviously, are a, are a whole different ball game to, to to mink. Even you think mink? And we do have native crayfish. We do have native crayfish too. So um, and they and 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 again, American signal crayfish. Ah, America. I'm sorry to all our American <laughs> listeners. I know. You're I know. causing I'm us sorry, problems guys. here. <laughs> You're sending <laughs> sending all the stuff that we don't we already have or don't need. I'm so sorry. Um but do trade with us after Brexit. <laughs> um we um American signal crayfish, again, similar to mink, you put them into an aquatic environment and they just start to eat everything. Yeah. It's a very it's very very similar situation. It's the it's they're the, like underwater mink. They basically. are underwater mink. Mm-hmm. And that you know what you get is you suddenly you're sort of you're doing your bio, your biodiversity assessment of of a water body and you go holy cow there's nothing in here. <laughs> and then you you find crayfish and um the problem with crayfish is once they're in a water body it's it's very difficult to get rid of them because you can trap them. But you can't trap them as quickly as you as as, as they reproduce because I mean we we were using sort of lobster lobster, yeah, lobster pot sort pot. of things and you know we were pulling tens hundreds in a week you know out of some of these water bodies not even an impact at all you you'd put you'd, you'd, over a week you'd say pull out a hundred out of a pond and you you think great brilliant we've I've hit the nail on the head it. yes progress go back next week it's exactly the same amount you know it just it's incredible. So that's not particularly efficient. Then you've got the poisoning route. So you section off either either an enti- entire, entire if it's river. a lake or a yeah. pond or a section of river, something like that. Poison it, kill off everything else. But it's, it it kills everything. Everything. You it kills, yeah, you can't you can't target. So Start again, it, you 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 literally, it's the nuclear option for a, for a water body. So you go in there, you kill absolutely everything, and you think brilliant. So that's at least uh, everything's dead. But at least the crayfish are dead too, or they're not. More often than not, what happens is they'll bed down, and then the poison will dissipate, and they'll come back up. So, so they go deep into the and mud. They'll they'll burrow in in a low oxygen yeah, environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they'll just sit there, bide their time, because they 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 know something's wrong. They'll 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 they're clever make themselves. Buggers, they are. Aren't they? Yeah, yeah. 
It's, and um, you know, so you, so you, you've, you kill you've nuked ev- the you, pond. You kill everything. <laughs> And then the crayfish are still there. So they're basically they're the terminator of they the are. underwater world. They are. And um, again, they, they don't spread by themselves. And more often than not, what you'll see is its introduction by humans who, who are cause, where you're getting these incidents of outbreaks. Especially in Scotland, we've got a couple of cases where people have been stocking lochs with them. Uh, and what, this sort why of thing. do people do that? I, I, I've never really understood I, it. I I wish for I could. food. Well, yeah, yeah, because they want to catch them and eat them, or so, I don't know. I I really don't know. Um, but we've had a number of incidents where we've been finding them. Obviously, they do spread by themselves once they're in an area. Yeah, but, but you've got to ask you're questions. Not, you're not suddenly going to find them in 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 a loch in 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 the Cairngorms. Where, where they've had to walk 25 yeah, mile over land. Well, exactly. Yeah. You see a little, little, little row of them hiking up the mountains. It doesn't work like <laughs> that. Backpacks on. Yeah, exactly. They, they, they've been introduced there, so especially in Scotland. Incidents where, where you hear of them, you can almost be certain they've been introduced by someone. Because so. I don't think we have any native crayfish in Scotland. I'm I I I'm not sure. I, don't I, I wouldn't think. So. I mean, they've got them in they've got them in Lake District, so maybe yeah. maybe just on the border. But I don't know of any. I, yeah, maybe yeah. someone someone who listens to this podcast will know no, if we have native yeah, crayfish. Exactly. No, but anyway. So yeah, I was I was dealing with 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 crayfish and uh, and and giant hogweed to a certain degree down in down in Milton Keynes, and then um, wanted to get back to Scotland. So uh, this 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 heard about this project, and. Uh, was able to come back up as a result of that as a, as a refugee from Milton <laughs> Keynes, um, but you know it's what what I'm learning is no matter where you go in the UK, invasive species are an issue. You know, more often than not, some of them are very obvious, giant hogweed. Some of them are not very obvious, mink, crayfish. Unless you knew what you were looking for, you wouldn't know They're what so you elusive know they were there. Mink, mink yeah, are so elusive. Exactly. So unless you're looking for spore on sand. Yeah, yeah. You're probably never going to see one. No, exactly. And whilst you're not seeing them, they're eating away yeah. through your native biodiversity. And in, in the example of mink, a female has can have up to eight babies in one year. She'll have sort of a, a batch up to eight. That's eight more suddenly. So if you've got, you know... Start it, doing the multiply. Yeah, you do a multiply. If you've got six, so seven, eight, nine... breed one a year? Uh, yeah, year? so just one, one breed once a year. How long do they take to get become mature enough to breed? Is it a year old? Um, I think it's a year, maybe two. Yeah, depends. Um, it's quite a quick turnaround. Yeah. Um, it could even be a year. I, I'm, I'm not entirely confident on that. It might be two years. Um, I should know this, but I'm more interested in killing them. Um, <laughs> but no, it, it's it's a very quick turnaround. And because you're only really dealing with natural causes, a female has eight. Those eight have a very high chance of surviving, because yeah, and then spreading out yeah. and finding somewhere else. So you 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 look at say you've got ten, fifteen resident females along an entire river, like the South Esk or something. You then multiply that by eight every year, and it starts to add up. You know, so it's 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 <laughs> the situation can get out of hand very very quickly, and because it's not obvious, it happens in the background, yeah. and suddenly. You know, you get people, I, I talk to a lot of people say, yeah, you know, we used to have ducks, we used to have more hens, we used to have, you know, all sorts of small, all small mammals. We don't know where they've gone. <laughs> and like, I have a good I guess. know exactly where they've gone, unfortunately, you know, and that's the thing. It, it, it happens slowly and then it happens really, really quickly. Or when you notice, yeah. you know that you've got yeah. a problem. Once, once you notice, assume that the problem is a lot worse than you're just noticing. Because if you're noticing it, it's been going on for quite some time. And that's that's obviously a concern because you then have to act quite quickly. Do they live right on the bank? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can live right on the bank or or a little bit off, but they because they're because they're based around the watercourses, yeah. they'll usually live on the bank or around the bank. Yeah. If people want to find out or somehow get involved with yeah. the project and help you become a volunteer, what's the best way to do that? So the best way is to visit our website, Scottish Invasive Species initiative um it's a, it's a long long title but you just google that you'll be directed to our website and we have a, a sort of generic email on the website that you can you can get in touch with us it with that goes to our our volunteer coordinator vicky she's a lovely lady and then she'll put you in 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 touch with uh with uh with the relevant project officers either myself down here in the south or my my colleagues al karen 
uh, James, whoever it might be up in the Spey or, or, or the Devon and that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, our website's the best way to go. And and, uh, and is there resources on your website for people that yeah, are out, out with Scotland? Yeah, there's a lot of information on there just about, you know, the species, control, all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's if you're if you're just interested in, in knowing a bit more about giant hogweed, for example, there's information on there about that. We also signpost you to really useful locations on the internet as well. So there's other there's other websites that do quite a good job of, you know, if you're if you're interested more in in the in in in, in some 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 slightly weirder aspect that we might not want to cover for the general public, there'll be a link and you can follow that yeah. and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, we that that's sort of the go-to place because we've got all the information there. If you want to contact us directly, you can do it through there. And if you want a bit more information, we're signposting to various places as well. So that's uh, that's what I would recommend. You can always get hold of me too, but uh, I'd go through the website just because uh, <laughs> I otherwise I get inundated by fans. And <laughs> fans, <laughs> all your fan mail, all my fans of the 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 uh, mink dispatcher of uh, of Angus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mark, it's been a fascinating conversation. Well, uh, thank you. I, I hope that it's intrigued people enough to go and look into invasive species. We'll be able to update people on, we will. on our... Yeah. Our well, I think you, you, you're you going to be updating the trust probably for most well, meetings, yeah, we, I guess. Yeah, well, I, I wasn't here this time because it was uh, it was over the winter, so there wasn't a lot going yeah. on. But I'll be doing regular updates. Perfect. And, uh, we, I, we will be... Obviously, because we've got HLF funding, we have to make sure that we're really, really on point when it comes to reporting what's going on and how progress is so obviously the, the fishery boards will be getting all that as well okay. as partners so um yeah we hopefully over the next three four years we can see uh some real progress and have have a positive step For, towards yeah. protection of scottish and maybe even uk biodiversity well, what we'll do is we'll keep our listeners updated as I get updated from you through, yeah, the, yeah. through the Fisheries Trust. And then in three years' time, hopefully we're still doing the podcast, yeah, we'll, we'll exactly. have you back on and you can talk about the last four years. That would be good. We can have an equally ran- rambly sort of me just <laughs> sort of stream of consciousness about invasive That's species. That's what people want, though. Well, I don't think I covered nearly as much as I could have, but I think I hope I've given people a, a sort of idea of what's going on and, you know what the situation's like and um, obviously these are just four species yeah, is what people yeah, have to yeah. remember these are just four there's a huge number of invasive species but, but out it, there. it's 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 indicative it's, of of the bigger picture but it's smart to only have four because yes. you've got to pick because well, you, otherwise it, it needs ridiculous. to be something that's achievable yeah well exactly it, we we you know we were thinking of putting rhododendron onto the project at one point and we went wait a minute hold on no 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 because all we'd be doing is dealing with rhododendron and the other the other species would have been ignored so yeah we we were very clear with right let's just pick some species that a we know we can make progress on and b we don't overcrowd ourselves with with a million different yeah. species and be pulled all over the yeah. place a so. lot of people i would guess probably don't realize that rhododendrons not native. i know you wouldn't think in scotland would you no i mean yeah, it's no, everywhere it's everywhere <laughs> and that's that's the situation we'll end up with with these other species if we if we don't it's do very pretty about it. it's lovely it's lovely it's lovely it just uh slowly cra- slowly yeah, spreading across everything Scotland. yeah nothing grows underneath that canopy. well exactly so and and yeah that's the situation where we might find you've got a lot of rhododendron a lot of mink a lot of giant hogweed, not much else. So let's let's all work together to, to prevent that from happening and keep what what we know and and love and keep that biodiversity and 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 protect what is actually I think a very unique part of the world because uh, I I would hate to see that disappear. Oh, well, I'm I'm pretty confident that you're going to get at least one or two emails off the back of this podcast of people say so. saying how can I help. Yeah, no, yeah, I mean I, that's always sure. like I say we've I I. I've had numerous people get hold of me and it's always been fantastic. You know, people, people think, Oh, well, what can I, what can I do? I'm only one person. And that's the wrong way of looking at it. Cause you're just one person. But then if you're doing something and the person down the road from you is doing something and their friends doing something, it all starts to add up. And suddenly you've got hundreds, thousands of people working together to achieve something. And suddenly your little effort, Oh, well, it's just one mink. Oh, it's just one patch of Japanese knotweed. Well, if every person is just dealing with one mink and one patch of Japanese knotweed, it adds up. It adds up. Yeah, you know, it it really does. And suddenly, a, a problem that looks insurmountable, if you divide it across lots and lots of people and everyone's working together, that problem suddenly becomes incredibly solvable. And that's that's really good to see. And I think 
with the people I've worked with so far, they're sort of sitting there going, well, actually, you know, this, I am making a difference. And that's a really good feeling to know that actually you're, you're, you're playing a part in this and it, you can make a difference. And that's, that's really important. An army of conservationists and a yeah. new wave of naturalists. We that's all what have, you're creating. We all have to be conservationists, I think. Yeah, well, you know, we didn't cause this situation directly, um, but we all have a responsibility and we all have the ability to 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 take action. And that's that's really empowering, you know. Yes, it's not easy. I won't pretend it is. Um, you know, we, we're, we're, at, we're at a difficult point right now, nationally, globally, but... Every person who decides to get involved with this project or with another conservation project or something like that, that's one more person who's helping to achieve these really important goals and that adds up and that's that's brilliant. Mark, thank you very much for coming into the office today. I'm you know what I'm one of the things I'm most excited about is getting the daily updates from yeah. our dad <laughs> when he gets <laughs> on that the mink craft, on yeah. his mink craft. And I guarantee you the first time we, we hear of it we're sort of excitedly yeah. is gonna be when he gets prints on the clay and it's gonna uh, be a WhatsApp message to both yeah. of us. Just so wall to wall mink port <laughs> it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be yeah, good. Well, hopefully well. If we uh, ho- hopefully, if they are about, we manage to get one. I kind of, we'll it's kind of, it's a, like a catch twenty two. I kind of hope they're not here. Yeah, <laughs> but well, equally, I kind of want to trap them. That's the thing. It's a, it is a catch twenty two. You don't want them, but if if they are here, we'll find them. Yeah, so. good. Well, thanks, Mark, and we'll catch Great you again stuff, soon, guys. Brilliant. Thanks for listening to the show. I hope you found that informative. I I did anyway. Learned a few I things learned about our yeah. our local our local ecosystem. And, of course, we hope you enjoyed um, Sir David explaining what the Year of the Salmon is all about. I never, I never actually thought, w- one, we would meet him. Secondly, actually have the opportunity to have his voice on our sh- on our podcast. Well, that podcast. was like, never, never when we started this did we think we would have probably the most famous man on the planet. Well, especially his voice. His voice, yeah. I would say, do you think his voice, his voice is probably more famous, more than, famous he than he is? Yeah. Which is a... Yeah, it, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what? If I had thought about it at the time, what, we were so busy that day. We that should have gotten to do an intro. That's exactly what I was thinking. Damn it. This is the Into the Wilderness podcast. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> God damn it. Yeah, we should have done that. Yeah, that would have been immense. Can you imagine having that as our intro every yeah, time? Yeah, I know. You're just going to have to put up with us, I'm afraid. Maybe if we cut enough words. <laughs> this problem. Mm, I don't think you used the word wilderness. No, I don't think you did. Uh, Anyway, that is pretty much us. Don't forget to enter the competition to win a Hornady reloading manual. All we wanted to know was what is your suggestion for a guest who we should have on the show? Send us an email or comment on the post on social media. And the most intriguing suggestion will be the winner. Um, Don't forget to check out the Pangolin Auction, which we gave you some details on at the start. Yes, and if you are new to the show and just finding your feet, there are loads and loads of ways to listen. We know that we mention this on the end of every show, but there's a reason for it because we do get contacted um, quite often with people asking how you listen to the show. And uh, our go-to place now is if you do not own an Apple phone, which there is actually a huge amount of people that don't, uh, then Spotify is probably your, your Spotify Stitcher are probably your top two uh, podcast apps. They're both free uh, with Spotify. I'm pretty sure you don't need to put any credit card details just to listen for free. No. Uh, no. So um, completely free, and you get some good music on Spotify as well if you're in the right section. If you're in the top 50, then it's crap. <laughs> uh, you will be hearing from us again in two weeks' time where we will be bringing you the incredible interview that we did with Eduardo Garcia. And as we mentioned the first time that we told you that we were going to be interviewing him, is if you haven't already, go and watch his film on Amazon Prime. Charged. Charged. Yeah. You have to watch it. Yeah, it'll blow you away. If you don't watch it, then you'll, you will be watching it after you yeah. listen to his interview. Thanks for listening. <laughs>